Have you ever anticipated the arrival of something so much that you found yourself just thinking about very little else? Perhaps there's something that you expected to come in the mail, and as soon as you saw that mailman show up, you're just, you're, you're, your mind was fixed on that thing. Maybe it was a letter from someone you love. Maybe it was a package coming in the mail. Um, maybe it was a, a job interview that you aced, and every time the phone rang, you thought for sure it would be somebody calling with a job offer. When I was a child, I really loved the anticipation and the buildup towards Christmas, and I considered it to be like a personal challenge to try to guess what it was that my parents would stuff away in closets and corners uh, because I loved the anticipation and the buildup to opening those gifts that were, were tucked underneath the Christmas tree on Christmas Day. This morning we begin our Advent season. If you're not necessarily from a, a, a liturgical church background, Baptist churches don't tend to be terribly liturgical. Uh, this Advent thing might be a little bit new to you as it was to me uh, in my adult years. But the word Advent comes from the Latin word Adventus, meaning coming. In the Advent season, we celebrate the coming of Christ. We prepare to celebrate the birth of Christ by anticipating through reflection on the scriptures, the coming of Jesus. Again, though our church doesn't necessarily utilize all of the rituals and formalities of other traditions, we do think that it can be a very helpful time for us to reorient ourselves around the grand miracle of the incarnation, that God himself has taken on human flesh. And not only just for us as individuals, but also for families, to orient and to calibrate our families around something much more significant than just the over-commercialism of our society. And so this is the first Sunday of Advent. And our goal this morning is to go all the way back to the very beginning of history and to contemplate our need for Advent, our need for the coming of Jesus. There are all sorts of places that we might go within the scriptures, talk about why Jesus needed to come. But again, this morning, we're going to go to the very beginning. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 3, one verse, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, though we'll lead up to it. If you remember something of Genesis, of course, Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And Genesis 1 is all about God's creation of the heavens and the earth. And after every day, God said, it is good, it is good, until day 6, when he creates the, the pinnacle, the capstone of creation, and that's the creation of humanity, and God says, it is very good. Genesis chapter 2 focuses exclusively on the creation of humanity, man and woman, with gender and dignity, and he places them in this place called the Garden of Eden, this, this paradise. That's Genesis chapter 2. But then in Genesis chapter 3, all of that changes. As Genesis 3 specifically focuses on the fall of humanity into sin as humanity rebels against God. And Genesis chapter 3 begins to describe some of the consequences, again, of humanity's sin. Well, it's in that context, the context of brokenness and in the context of sin, that the need for Advent begins to become clear. Our objective for this morning is to contemplate the need for Advent by focusing specifically on that one verse, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. God's very first declaration of his intention to save. So in order to lead into Genesis 3, 15, I want to begin by reading the, the preceding verses beginning in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. So if you have a Bible, let me encourage you to open your Bible to Genesis chapter 3 and follow along. I'm going to read Genesis 3 beginning in verse 1. And we'll make our way up to our text for today. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. 
For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will become like God, knowing good and evil. Verse 6, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and she ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was there with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made for themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Verse 9, but the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid. Because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. And then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I And it's from this point on that everything about God's perfect world is turned upside down from Genesis 3 through the rest of the scriptures. Innocence is gone. Just as Paul says in Romans chapter 5, one man's trespass in Genesis chapter 3, one man's trespass will lead to condemnation and death for all people. Not only will Adam die, but the sin of Adam will be imputed to all of his descendants. Imputation, meaning it's counted against all of his descendants. In Adam's rebellion, the entire race, which race? The human race. In Adam's rebellion, the entire race rebels against God. Because of Adam's sin all those years ago, I too am a sinner. I'm counted as a sinner before God, even before I've breathed my first. Sin becomes that permanent reigning power at work within me, at work within you, at work within them, at work within us. And the effects of sin are cosmic, catastrophic. The world is broken and busted. Thorns infest the ground, according to Genesis chapter 3. God's beautiful world becomes a place of sweat and pain. Relationships are broken, marriages are broken, families are broken, friendships are broken, societies are broken. And so we find ourselves, even now, all those years ago, now on this day, we find ourselves even still living in a world in which we deal with the catastrophic effects of sin, tragedy, and fear, and evil, and the daily experiences of sickness, and death, and suffering. All you need to do to prove this to yourself is open up the newspaper. In fact, don't even open it. Look at the front page. Look at the front page and you're going to see the evidence of the fact that we still live in a world affected by Genesis chapter 3. In a community like ours, just the names that I'm about to say to you would cause differences of opinion across the room, I'm sure. But these are words, these are names that, that, are, that are evidence of the fact that we still live amidst the catastrophic effects of sin. Kyle Rittenhouse. The coronavirus. Climate change. Ahmad Arbery. Elizabeth Holmes. The Waukesha Parade. Afghani refugees. And we could go on and on and on and on to show the evidence of the fact that we live in a world that has been experiencing the consequences of sin ever since Genesis chapter 3. And so given the decimation of our world by the consequences of sin, whose sin? My sin, your sin, our sin, all of our sin. One might look at the evidence and say, "Uh uh-oh, Satan has won. Satan ultimately had the victory there. But neither humanity's sin nor Satan's deceit can nullify the sovereignty of God. 
Remember, it's in the context of brokenness that we begin to see our need for Advent. The next four words in Genesis chapter 3, verse 14, the next four words underscore the fact that God still sits on the throne, that he's sovereign. Verse 14, the Lord God said, I love it. All that's just happened, all that rebellion, all the consequences of all of that continuing like, like, a, like a huge arrow into our present day. In, in the middle of all that, the Lord God said, because evil will not have the final word. God will have the final word. One by one, God is going to establish the fate, the direction of, of, of the serpent and of the, the woman of Adam. He's, he's going to establish direction for history. You see, God isn't going to leave it up to the whims and the fickle nature of sinful people. God is going to declare to each one of these three, the serpent, and then to the woman, and then to the man. God is going to declare both a word of punishment and a word of promise. Again, verse 14. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you've done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. So again, God addresses the serpent first, the snake. As a creature within God's created world, the snake will be the lowest among all the creatures, cursed above all the livestock, cursed above all the beasts of the field. Here are some of the consequences for that snake. It's going to crawl on its belly. You ever seen a snake stand up and walk away? No, snakes crawl on their bellies because, well, we'll get there in a minute. They crawl on their bellies. And secondly, they will eat dust all the days of their lives. And in, 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 in the ancient world, eating dust was symbolic of extreme humiliation. Perhaps it would be the same thing now if we were to eat dust. It's a consequence of extreme humiliation. In the first service, I took a show of hands to see how many people in the service actually like snakes, so I kind of know like who to stay away from. How many of you here uh, like snakes? Uh, you know, there's actually, there was actually more in the first service. So those of you who are snake lovers, um, the first service might be your, might be your place. <laughs> I am not a snake lover. Uh, I do not like snakes at all. In fact, in our home in Connecticut where I was raised, we had snakes, but they were just those, you know, those black ones that were non-venomous and didn't like those either because they're just slithering things. Um, anyways, the point is that God pronounces this curse specifically on snakes, and it's I, again, it's curious because snakes are not rational creatures. Snakes don't make decisions to do things. And yet God fixes this into the created order as a reminder of something that we need to be remembering on a regular basis. The subjugation of snakes within the created world serves as a perpetual reminder of the fact that, that Satan is under the judgment of God. You see, when you see a snake slithering on its belly, eating the dust, you ought to be reminded, whether you like a snake or not, you, you ought to be reminded of the fact that God has the final word and he has cursed Satan. His fate is fixed. Now, if these are words of punishment in, the, in this verse, verse 14, then the next verse, verse 15, which is our text for today, is the word of promise, not for the snake, but for all of those who are affected by the sin of Genesis chapter 3. In fact, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 has oftentimes been called uh, by a big, long Latin word, the proto-evangelium. Proto meaning first, evangelium meaning gospel. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 has been referred to as the first gospel, the first declaration of God's intention to save. It's not because God created in Genesis chapter 3. In fact, God from eternity past had this in mind to save us. Yet in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, we find the first moment in history where God declares his intention to save. Listen to these words, and we'll go through this slowly. Genesis 3, verse 15, God says, I will. Again, God takes the initiative here. 
If there's going to be a reversal of the situation of total depravity, remember that, 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 that sin is the permanent reigning principle within you, within me, within our society at large. If that is going to be reversed, how is it going to happen? It's going to happen because God says, I will do something. You see, salvation always originates with him, not with us. It's God doing for us what we desperately need but cannot do for ourselves. God says, I will put enmity, enmity is not really a common word, we don't use that a whole lot, like, you know, enmity is a, uh, it, it basically it means hatred. It's the hostility of lines being drawn up between enemies. You might think of like the bears and the broncos or whatever, the bears and the lions playing each other. You might think that that's enmity, that's not enmity, that's competition. See, enmity is hatred, it's deep hatred. God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between the serpent and the woman, between your offspring, speaking again to the ser- speaking to Satan, between your offspring and her offspring. You see, the enmity, that, that hatred is to continue for generations to come. And God continues, he, speaking of the offspring of the woman, he shall bruise your head. And you, speaking of the devil himself, you shall bruise his heel. Whose heel? The heel of the offspring of the woman. You see, injury is going to be inflicted in both directions. And the word that's used here uh, is, is for, for bruising is, is the same word in Hebrew. There's bruising going on in both directions. But the injuries are different. You see, only the injury inflicted upon Satan will be permanent and fatal. God declares right here in Genesis chapter 3 that there will come a time that from the offspring of a woman, the fate of Satan will be fixed and over. And I think it's a beautiful thing that right here in Genesis chapter 3, no sooner has the curtain dropped on that scene of rebellion against a good God, rebellion against the righteousness and the holiness of God, the curtain has dropped and, and without even blinking an eye, God decrees how he is going to resolve the problem of sin. We have such a good, kind, loving God. You see, he doesn't say, I'm going to let them stew in their guilt for a while. I'm going to let them stew in their shame. I'm going to let them wonder how they're going to work this out. He doesn't do that. You see, in the very next verse, in the very next verse, God declares how he is going to resolve the problem of our sin. Adam's sin will not be the end of the story. Satan's power will not be the end of the story. Remember, Advent means coming. So from the very first pages of Scripture, anticipation begins to build for the offspring of the woman who will come to extinguish Satan. We could spend hours and hours just tracing, tracing the line of promise throughout the Old Testament. Of course, Adam and Eve have three sons, but the promise is going to pass through the line of Seth. And then there's Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and there's this line of promise that we could trace throughout the Old Testament. But we're not, we're not going to go there today. What I would like to do now is to point to a, a couple of places in the New Testament to look at how the promise established in Genesis 3.15 is fulfilled in the teachings of the New Testament. Again, the promise that God makes in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, is that from the, the, the offspring of the woman will come one who crushes the head of Satan. Again, three different texts that show us how this has worked out, how Genesis 3.15 has worked out in the New Testament. First, let me point, at, point to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Galatians 4, Paul writes, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. You see, so significant was the birth of Jesus. That's what Paul's talking about here. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. So significant was the birth of Jesus that Paul calls it the fullness of time. God in his providence, you know, God doesn't, God is not the master chess maker. God knows the future and the past and the present as if it's just right now. 
God's providence, God had designated a moment in time, a moment in history when a child would be born, bringing to a crescendo God's design from eternity past to save fallen and sinful humanity. Among all the details that Paul could use to describe the fullness of time, the, 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 the event that happens in the incarnation, Paul says that this Jesus who was born in the fullness of time, Paul says that he is both the son of God and the son of a woman. And if you think about that for a minute, you like take your theological hat off for a moment, just think like biology, of course he was a son of a woman. I mean, was it coming from a guy? Why include that detail? Because Paul knows Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. That there would be one who comes from the offspring of a woman who would bruise the head of the serpent and crush Satan underfoot. So the promise of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, that declaration of God's intention to save, finds its fulfillment in the incarnation, in the birth of Jesus, in that very first Christmas. And yet that was only the beginning. Another text, Romans chapter 16, verse 20. We hear another echo of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Romans 16, 20. Paul, again, Paul writes, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This is the final chapter of Paul's uh, major epistle to the Romans. And in this final chapter, he's in the context of, of warning them about the false teachers, the impact and the influence of false teachings in the, in, the, in, the, in the church. Paul says that the discord caused by false teachings is not just human confusion or organizational confusion. It comes from the devil himself. Paul says that the discord of false teachings is attributed to Satan because Satan is the author of discord. But God is the author of peace. But yet here again in this verse, Paul uses the language of Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 to describe something that from that vantage point has not yet happened. He declares that God will crush Satan underfoot. The crushing of Satan in this text is not just about crushing Satan, but it's about crushing underfoot every evil. Every effect of sin within the world, everything that has been turned upside down, Paul points towards the future, saying that this will happen. So again, putting this all together, in one sense, the promise of Genesis 3.15 definitely finds fulfillment in the birth of Jesus. And yet even more, there's another sense in which the promise yet still remains to be fulfilled at a time in the future. One more text, the book of Revelation, that tremendously confusing symbolic book of Revelation. John, the author, uses the language of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, many times throughout the book of Revelation when he speaks about the ultimate defeat of Satan. I want to point specifically to a few verses in chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, you'll see some fragments of those verses here on the screen. I'm going to read beginning in verse 1. John writes, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit in a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent. There it is right there. John is making mention of that ancient serpent. Which serpent? Who is the devil and Satan? You see, John knows that that, that tempter in the garden, that snake in the garden, that was the devil himself. That ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years. Then in the context of Revelation chapter 20, there's this 1,000 year reign of Christ. And then after that millennial period, verse 7, when the thousand years are ended, verse 10, the devil will be thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur to be tormented day and night forever and ever. Friends, that is the crushing of the head of the serpent. 
Though the promise of Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 finds its initial fulfillment in the birth of Jesus when the eternal Son of God took on human flesh in the incarnation, though it finds initial fulfillment in Christmas morning, ultimate fulfillment will be experienced in the second coming. In the second coming. You see, Satan has been dealt the decisive death blow in the first coming of Christ, in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. But someday in the future, Satan, and by the way, with him all things that are evil, Satan in every evil will be fully and finally and irreversibly extinguished. That's that day that's coming in the future. I'm not a boxer. There might have been a time when I was a kid that when I thought that that would be pretty cool, you know, just like punching people for a living. Um, if you're a boxer, you can probably explain to me why it's not just punching people for a living. But I, anyways, um, just imagine the, 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 the disorder that would happen in your head getting knocked, knocked, knocked all the time. But anyways, in a boxing match, when a boxer is knocked to the ground, what happens? When the boxer is knocked to the ground, the referee comes and stands over top of the boxer and begins to count. Ten. Nine. The boxer is counting because the boxer wants to see if the grounded man can get up on his own. Can the grounded man get up on his own? Does he have the strength and the ability to get up? You see, nobody comes up to the grounded person. The person is laying there. Maybe, maybe, they're, maybe they're like passed out. Maybe they're writhing in pain. Maybe they're just like there's all this fluid coming out of the different orifices. They're, whatever. They're, they're laying there and they're incapacitated. But nobody goes over and says, hey, man, let me help you up so we can finish this thing. Now he's just laying there. And the referee's counting, the 10 count. And if the boxer who has been grounded does not get up, what happens? The referee announces that the other boxer is the victor. Perhaps this helps us to frame up the times in which we live. You see, Jesus has already come. In the first coming of Jesus, he dealt the knockout punch to the devil. And it's as if he is lying on the ground with the 10 count going right now. And we don't know how long that count is going to take. But we wait in this interim period for the second coming of Jesus. When that 10 count is complete. Again, though the enemy has been knocked down, though he's been knocked out, there will come a time, there will come a time when he will be fully, completely, eternally, irreversibly defeated. And Jesus will be universally, irreversibly declared to be the victor. All of this, by the way, is the rationale for what we do at Advent. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 gives us the rationale for what we do in Advent. You see, it's the, in the context of human need. It's in the context of brokenness. It's in the context of sin that the need for Advent begins to become clear. Advent is about the anticipation of the fulfillment of the promise that is first declared in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. And as such, it ought to affect us in at least two ways as we celebrate Advent in this season. Number one, we celebrate the birth of our Savior. You see, God has not left us alone in that place of agony, in sin. God saw the brokenness and bustedness of our world. God did not leave us alone to stew in our juices, so to speak. In the midst of depravity and brokenness, the offspring of the woman has come. The offspring of the woman has come, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made. The offspring of the woman has come. Jesus has been born. And yet he who has come will come again. And so in this Advent season, we not only celebrate the birth of Jesus, but we also anticipate the return of our Savior. God's work of salvation is not finished. The offspring of the, of the woman shall come again. 
with glory to judge the quick and the dead. His kingdom will have no end. The enemy will be fully, completely, eternally, irreversibly defeated. Satan and every other evil and every other thing that, 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 that has turned the world upside down, Satan will be fully and finally extinguished. And so this Christmas season, yes, we look back that our Savior has come, but we look forward in great anticipation for his second coming. So we have four Sundays on the Advent calendar, typically in a church that's, uh, again, a bit more traditional than ours. So here at Skokie Valley, we've taken some liberties. We're going to do it for five weeks. Because uh, the, fifth, the fifth Sunday is December 26th. It just seemed to make sense. Five Sundays. Anticipating the coming of Jesus. Anticipating the crushing of Satan underfoot. Anticipating the fulfillment of all of God's promises of salvation. I'll never forget the first time I saw a snake in Rwanda. Again, a snake in Connecticut is kind of benign. There's no poisonous snakes in, like, all of New England. But poisonous or, or snakes in Rwanda are a little bit more threatening. I was walking up a hill to our house. It was dark. It was like 6 o'clock, and it was just really dark outside. And the lights had gone off in the neighborhood. Electricity was off in the area. And the, everything's on a hill in Rwanda. There's no flat place, not like here where everything is flat. Everything is up or down. And so it was dark, and I'm walking uh, up a dirt road, and because of the heavy torrential downpours, there's, there are ruts and there are holes and there are rocks, lots of places to stumble. So I have my flashlight out, and I'm shining that flashlight. Not, a, not, not like 10 feet in front of me, but like a pace or two in front of me because I want to see that thing that's going to cause me to stumble. So there I am walking along that path, that road, that dirt road, up the hill towards our house. And there out of nowhere, the light shone on a thick black body. The black body of a snake in Central Africa. And I'm a little scared. I'm a little freaked out. Right there in front of me. I jumped back. I jumped back and I shouted loud, startled, afraid. Because that's what you do when you see a snake. Well, at least that's what I do when I see a snake. And then under the cover of darkness, I didn't even know there were people watching. People started to laugh really loud. They're laughing at this guy who's jumping backwards from a, from a snake. Now, to be clear, Rwandans don't like snakes either. But they're laughing at me, this guy who's jumping in the other direction. Because they knew something that I had not yet known. They too had seen the snake, but they weren't afraid. Why? Because they knew that somebody had already taken a big massive shovel and whacked that thing over the head. <laughs> that snake was dead. The only thing left to do was to laugh. It was gone. It was eradicated. From the very earliest scenes of human history, sin has been the reigning principle in our lives and in our world. Yet Adam's sin is not the end of the story. Satan's deception, Satan's deluded power is not the end of the story. The struggle will have an end, but God determines the end. From the offspring of the woman will come a descendant, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will extinguish Satan and evil, all evil. And it is within the context of that brokenness and that sin that the need for Advent becomes strikingly clear. Would you join me in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you. We give thanks to you because you are a God of promise. Immediately after humanity falls into sin, God, you, you make the promise that someday you will send the offspring of a woman, to rescue us. We praise you, Heavenly Father, that not only has our Lord Jesus come, which we get to celebrate in this season, but he will come again, and the world will be made right again. And so in this season, Lord, our, our hearts would cry out that you would come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. 
That's the desire of our souls and our hearts and the hope for the nations. Come, Lord Jesus. May it be in our day. May it be today. Lord, what does this world have? We thank you and we praise you for the opportunity to celebrate Advent together as a church. May our hope, calibrated around the coming of Jesus, be a testimony, a light, a beacon to a world that deeply and desperately needs to know that there's more, that there's more, that there's more. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.